Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 226, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 226th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name's Tim Mooney, and this is the uh, first podcast, let me get this right, the first show of the last month of 2020, and I'm sure you can all join me in saying yes <laughs> to to the last month of 2020. It's been a, it's been a ride, hasn't it? Um, I'm not even sure if we can call this Type 2 fun at all, but uh, looking forward to putting that in the rearview mirror as it were, and this month we've got some fun stuff uh, on tap. Uh, on this episode, we're going to be talking about something I've been intrigued about and actually decided to spend a little bit of time in my uh, off week here uh, doing a little bit of research on, and that is touring using an e-bike. And I think that this is something that might uh, fit into the world of controversy or controversy, as uh, folks in England would say, um, in a much better way than I would. Uh, I, I think that it's kind of intriguing, and, and I, I, I thought I would spend an entire episode talking about that. So we're going to do a full episode on touring by e-bikes. So first up, uh, by <laughs> you've probably figured this out. I am by far not an expert on this type of a thing. But e-bikes have piqued my interest for at least the last couple of years. Uh, turn the Wayback Machine back to the spring of 2019, and you may recall that I was doing the big DC to Cincinnati ride. That was sort of my last really, truly big tour that I've done, and I'm looking forward to doing more soon. Um, I remember very vividly, I am out oh, towards the tail end. I want to say in the last couple of days of riding, um, total, but also the last few days of riding on the Ohio to Erie Trail, and I'm going through a Mennonite country. And um, I'm riding and riding and riding, and it's kind of a gray day, and the, I got the trail largely to myself, and it's paved, as the Ohio to Erie Trail is in, in that section of the state. And all of a sudden, I just get smoked, and I mean smoked, passed by a, a kid on a Mennonite kid on an e-bike. And it was quite the sight to behold because, you know, the kids wearing, if you're not familiar with Mennonites, they, they tend to be a little more prim and proper, you know, kind of like, uh, almost sort of like they're dressy looking, but they're work work pants and then a button up shirt um and 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 a hat uh, kind of like a straw hat kind of a thing and a younger kid but had enough to have kind of a, a little bit of a stubble going on and the kid just smokes me on this very high wattage e-bike probably was going if i was going 10 or 12 miles per hour this kid was going a solid 20 at least it was i just got smoked and he gives me this little smirk as he goes by not 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 like being a jerk or anything but just kind of like a hey how you doing <laughs> and i i just I, I it was one of my favorite moments of the entire tour and it got me thinking it's like man you can cover a, a lot of ground on one of those things um so it got me thinking about e-bikes and so here we are a couple of years later nearly um so that's the first up that that's what got me started thinking about e-bikes and touring. I, I will say that actually it goes even further back than that. My very first tour, the organized tour that I've talked about a few times on the show, was with Climate Ride. And um, it was, of course, you know, a ride where everybody's raising money to combat climate change, things like that. It was in Northern California. And there were a couple of riders who were on e-assisted recumbent bikes and that was fascinating to me now this was an assisted tour we uh you know they weren't carrying any gear but this was also 10 plus years ago and and the technology for things have really changed on that they were carrying multiple batteries there was that were a lot of interesting questions with how they were doing it um and of course you know if they didn't have the capability to cycle without the e-assist um in other words, if they ran out of battery juice, they were riding a heavier bike than they ordinarily would. So that, that was a big challenge for them. And anyway, so, you know, those combination of things have always got me thinking about e-bikes as a mode of touring. So the second thing I want to talk about here, now that I've talked about why this has been on my mind, is 
the big controversy, which is, is this cheating? And I think that you get a lot of variation on all of this. Um, I am a big fan of, uh, and Brock Dittis, uh, uh, producer emeritus of the Sprocket, uh, definitely uh, has joined me on this, the hashtag not cheating <laughs> Uh, kind of mantra and i don't think that this is cheating I, I, and and all i have to do is look at you know the fact that this is just using another bit of technology just like having better gearing you know if i'm i remember very well when i was uh, cycling with mysterious james in the early years he had his surly long haul trucker and i had a bike that was i think it was a marin that was not geared well and i for whatever reason, I didn't look into the fact that there was differences between gears. This is what, why, how much of a noob I was, you know. I was, I was always asking him, what number gear are you in? And he'd be like, I don't know, man. I'm just spinning. It's fine. And he's just zooming up these hills. And I'm struggling like crazy because my gear ratios were totally different. And I'm pressing in and struggling going. His third gear is much better than mine. And I never kind of figured out why until many years later that, you know, having different gearing makes a big difference. And so I'd say the same thing, you know, it's like if if you're using technology in gearing, is that cheating? I don't think anybody would ever would argue against that. Now, I think this is very different. Of course, you know, you're using your own power and your own mechanical advantage versus having a battery assist or even a battery throttle. Okay. I mean, I can get that. I happen. I, I'm a big fan of Ride Your Ride, and I just don't think that this is cheating. I think that this opens up touring for more people. I think it extends the abilities of people more, and I'm all for that. So I, I don't think I don't consider this cheating. I know that there are other folks out there that would disagree with me. I know that there's big controversy around the use of this in the bike packing context where people are going out into wildernessy areas using e-assist and then that might be considered well it could be dangerous if people aren't physically able to do that on their own should they be out there with battery assist look i i think i still stand firmly in the column of uh, this is not cheating and this is actually a good thing as long as it's done in a reasonable way and this kind of gets me to the third thing which is another area of criticism for the use of e-bikes in in all sorts of different contexts. You know, there's been a lot of legal and I think more importantly, social pushback against e-bikes in a lot of places. You know, they're characterized as mopeds, believe it or not, under some state laws. And I've got a link in the show notes to a map that shows where that is. Um, it's actually, you know, the e-bikes going where e-bikes or, or traditional bikes are allowed is actually um, it's restricted in a lot of states. It's actually kind of fascinating to see that. So take a look at the show notes on the map there. It may even be out of date by this point, but check that out. If you spend any time on social media, there are all caps opinions on this. <laughs> Let me just say, I mean, I, I, I can't remember what, uh, what it was, whether it was Facebook or wherever, but it was definitely regarding the C&O. Of course, the trail here in my backyard, you know, oh, these bikes are too fast and they're too dangerous and blah, blah, blah. You know, it wasn't even until last summer that any type of e-bike was allowed on the CNO at all. In fact, they were completely, um, well, they were restricted. You weren't technically allowed to use them. Now, that didn't mean that people didn't ride on the CNO with them. But, you know, I, I think that the criticisms that are out there for it generally are best left for the individual riders rather than anything else. You know, if you're being passed in a reckless way by someone on an e-bike, you know, that's no different than being passed in a reckless way by somebody who's going 20 miles per hour on a 15 mile per hour trail. So I, I, I do truly believe that so long as the user is using the bike within the limits and the rules of any given trail. I don't care if there's an e-assist going on or even if there's the throttle going on. I, and I know that there are folks that disagree with me on that, but you know, like I said, there are all caps opinions on all of this. So when it comes to a tour situation, I think that there's a whole bunch of different considerations. I just sort of bullet pointed these. You can tell I'm not super, super organized on all of this, but considerations. The first thing is that any kind of any assisted bike, it tends to be heavier. And that has been a problem for a long time. I think that's been the limiting factor for most touring uses or even bike, especially bike packing uses. But these bikes are getting lighter all the time. There are there, I think there are carbon framed versions of e-bikes, but there are definitely lighter and lighter frames. You, ha you don't have to carry as big of batteries. The, the motors that are running them are much, much lighter and less bulky. So these bikes are starting to get into a place where the efficiencies are matching up 
pretty well for doing a multi-day touring situation. So that's one thing that has changed over time. The big thing, of course, and this should go without saying, is that you've got to be able to charge up your batteries at any given time during the tour. Now, for the most part, especially if you can make it so that your range meets your daily needs, well, you may only have to charge up at the end of any given day, but that's going to be a limitation for you. You're going to have to pick tours where you've got access to an electrical outlet where you can plug in and safely leave that battery plugged in overnight. Now, does that mean that you're going to be able to use a hiker biker campsite on the Pacific coast? Maybe, but you know, I've had batteries swiped from a bathroom in one of them, Sunset Bay, I remember <laughs> in Oregon. Um, you know, and these are expensive, much bigger batteries. You know, are you going to, are you going to feel safe leaving that plugged in a uh, bathroom, which is the only real electrical outlet opportunities in any of these places? Or are you going to have to start staying at RV parks with, you know, electrical hookups and those tend to be more expensive? Or are you going to have to hotel it every time? You know, those are the types of considerations that you have to do. Uh, when you're thinking about this, you may also have to charge midday. I'll be talking about it in a, in a little bit here, but you know, going to places where there are grocery stores or other places where you have an external outlet available to you and you're going to have to be hunting that down. That's also going to make the nature of your your, your tour different. Um, you're not going to be doing backcountry tours and these things very easily unless you're hauling a bunch of extra fully charged batteries with you. So that's something you have to think about because of the next thing. When you run out of juice in your batteries, you're cranking away at a much heavier bike, especially if you're essentially using it mostly in throttle mode. That's going to really bring down your efficiency and your range as well. And, you know, even though they've gotten lighter, they're still heavier than much heavier than even a, a steel framed bike. Unless, of course, you're spending the extra bucks on, a, on one of those carbon frame or carbon fiber bikes. The range on these was formerly a limiting factor. I'll go back to 10 years ago. I remember having a conversation with those folks who were riding the recumbents, the electric recumbents. They gave a very minor e-assist, um, and they really struggled going up some of the famously steep and plentiful hills on that California section, uh, the Northern California section of the Pacific Coast Route. Their range on those batteries was, if I recall correctly, somewhere in the 20 to 30 mile range, and I'm sure it was much less in the hillier regions that we were going through. Nowadays, we're starting to see that the range on those things might be getting up into that kind of sweet spot, that 50, 60 mile range uh, for a ride. And, you know, when you're using these types of things, you, you're going to be able to cover those 50 or 60 miles much, much faster. The fun thing about that is that opens up things much more for you. Um, maybe you're able to carry multiple batteries and instead of doing 50 to 60 miles a day, you're going to be doing maybe closer to 100 miles a day. And you're doing a century every day. That's, that's a huge difference. Um, or for those of you who really like to stop and smell the roses or the diesel exhaust, <laughs> depending on where you're at. You know, this allows you to stop at every single lighthouse. It allows you to, to do things um, more frequently without having to worry about, oh, I need to make my miles today. You know, it's a much bigger thing. It allows you to have the possibility to handle the headwind days or the big hillier days. It's really something that you want to think about in terms of um, the range being extended means the power is being extended. So that's a really helpful thing. Battery technology is getting more efficient and much better all the time. I mean, think about your laptop. Your laptop used to be something that you could go unplug for maybe a few hours. Now, and especially these new Apple ones, apparently, man, you can go for sometimes multiple days of working full days on them. Battery technology is just getting much, much better. And, it, and I think that every year, I think a year from now, when you're listening to this show, maybe, I think the batteries are going to be even better. So we're starting to get into that place where battery technology is making all of this extra possible. One thing that I will definitely throw out there that uh, because these batteries are much bigger than your power banks that you are allowed to throw into your gear and fly with, uh, whether domestically or internationally, depending on where you're at, these batteries are too big to fly. So if you're thinking about using an e-bike for any kind of touring, you have to account for that. That may mean that you have to get batteries where you're going and leave them there. That's, that's an expensive proposition. So if you're thinking about doing this in a way where you are flying with your bike, you're not going to be able to bring the batteries and you're going to have to account for that. So are there ways to ship? Yes, but there are lots of restrictions on the shipment of these batteries as well. And that can be a real challenge and a real limiting factor. 
But if you're thinking about using your e-bike locally, or you're going to be using rail or other ways of transporting yourself and your bike to or from places, this might be a sweet spot for you as well. One last thing in a consideration in all of this is that the price point. These bikes tend to be expensive, but they are coming down all the time. Inexpensive e-bikes are falling below $1,000, and that's actually about the range for a good touring bike is in that kind of price point. So I think that if you're going to be getting a bike that is an e-bike that is worthy of touring, I think it's still going to be more expensive than your typical bike. But as we'll talk about in a minute here, you may not even have to get a whole new bike for this because there are options to convert an existing bike into an e-bike. But price is definitely going to be something you're going to have to be thinking of. And that doesn't even include the batteries and you're probably going to need to, uh, to use multiple, uh, multiple batteries on any given tour. Okay. So those are the considerations. I want to talk a little bit about some of the different types of batter of e-bikes that are out there. And again, some of these, there's a couple of different considerations and some of these overlap with each other. Um, this is not meant to be kind of the, the one-stop shopping for information on all of this because I've just done a little bit of research. First thing that you want to talk about with e-bikes is whether it is a pedal assist bike or whether it's a throttle bike. Sometimes you have both options in them. Pedal assist is using the least amount of energy and often you'll have that in um, a variety of different levels where it'll be maybe like a three level version of pedal assist where you're pedaling, you're giving the bike power, but you're getting a little bit of an E assist from the uh, motor that is attached to your bike. And that is really helpful. I have ridden a few of them in the DC area and elsewhere that are part of the bike share systems that are out there. And man, it is really wild how the, the, you're putting an effort, you're definitely cycling, but you're getting a lot faster based on the energy output that you're giving. So that's, I think, one of the most important things that I'm seeing for folks who want to continue cycling, but are finding that they can't do what they used to do. So this is going to extend maybe the age, maybe the capabilities. I've read about folks who have had double knee replacements and, you know, they couldn't bike the same anymore. But with an ESS bike, they could continue to bike and that brought them great joy. That's really great. So pedal assist is kind of the lowest level of all of this. It's also the most energy efficient. It's going to use the least amount of juice. You'll have different levels often on these bikes. So the faster you pedal, the more assist you're going to get. And um, that's there's also different levels that you can set for how much assist. So that's something to keep in mind. Some bikes have throttles, some don't, some ex exclusively have throttles, and that is basically, you think about it, sort of like a moped or a motorcycle. That basically, you give it a crank, and often there'll be different levels of throttle that you can give. And you can basically just sit back and coast, and um, that's going to give you, well, motion there. Um, some bikes have it, some bikes don't. Some places restrict throttle use altogether, some don't. It's important to know that. Um, it, as I've sort of thought about this, the question is, do I want a throttle? I don't think that I would issue it. Like, I wouldn't pay extra to not have one, um, but I probably wouldn't use it very often. I, I In the city, uh, when I've used the e-bikes uh, with the capital bike share, uh, there is a throttle and I'm like, eh, I'd rather bike. I'm here on a bike. I'd rather bike. So I don't think I'd use it very often, but you know, it might be handy, handy. What if you get injured or something like that? You know, it might be the something that can get you into town. If you have an injury and need to get into town, it might be worth having as a safety measure, even as I sit here and make this up on my head right here in front of the microphone, a couple of different types of drives in this. You've got mid drives and hub drives. Hub drives tend to be on the wheel. Mid drives tend to be in the middle of the bike and essentially kind of fit into your drivetrain system. And um, from what I understand, I think that the mid drives are more efficient. Hub drives tend to be a little bit cheaper. Those are the two different types there. I won't go into it too much more there, but it's it's interesting and worth checking out. Um, the mid drives, since they kind of sit lower and they aren't part of your wheel system, are also a little bit easier to handle, I think, uh, from a maintenance perspective, perhaps, but your mileage may vary on all of that. There are even e-assist trailers. This was news to me. I hadn't seen these. I've never seen these in the wild, but basically they are like any other trailer that you have attached to your bike, and it gives you a push. The one interesting thing about that is that I think that you can actually have more batteries in such a, such a thing, and I think that you could have higher range. I'm not sure how efficient they are. I'm also not so sure how wild I am about being pushed uh, in an e-bike situation. I'd be curious if anybody out there has one of these types of things. Last but not least, 
I had mentioned this before, there are retrofit kits out there for an existing bike that you have. You can actually slap it onto one of your wheels uh, and you can basically create an e-bike out of uh, virtually any bike that you have. Um, these might not be robust enough for touring. I haven't dug into them too much, but I, I've seen a lot of GoFundMes and other types of things that um, will uh, promote this type of stuff. I never really dug into it too deeply. I think that um, again, your mileage may vary on this. And what are you actually after? What are, what is your purpose? If your purpose is for more of a commuting type of a thing, that type of a package may work for you. That might be a good way to also just dabble in it because at your price point is going to be much lower for all of that. Also, if you're handy, if you're an Aaron Flores from the Sprocket podcast, there's your second drop for Sprocket today, you know, very handy wrenching, uh, then, you know, that might be something that would be a fun project for you to work on too. Not sure if they'd be robust enough for touring. Not sure about the battery situation with that. All right. One other thing that I also wanted to talk about, I keep saying one other thing, I've got many other things to talk about, is batteries. Uh, I think that that's the big limiting factor in some ways. Like, how many batteries do you want to carry? They, they can be heavy. Um, it's going to take up space. You're going to need multiple ones. Well, they've solved that in a few places in Europe where you basically can exchange a spent battery for a new one. Switzerland in particular, I, I've got a link in the show notes to a resource that talks about being, there being 600 locations in Switzerland where you can swap out at a variety of different stores, pubs, bars, things like that, a spent battery for a battery that is fully recharged. That is amazing. What a great situation. You're only carrying one. Maybe you carry two as a, an emergency situation. But yeah, if you're able to uh, do your traveling and have those types of things work out for you, um, where you're, you're at the end of the day, you go swap your battery and you're all set. That's fantastic. I think that that's a really great thing. Do we have that in the U.S.? Absolutely not. <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Um, I also think that we're a little, we're so big and spread out and a lot of our touring goes through rural areas. I think that would be very challenging. That might be the type of thing that you find in cities uh, more than anything else. Might not be something that would work for touring. I'm not even sure if Switzerland uh, would work out for something like that, but it's certainly something to check into. Um, I, I tend to find with European Union countries, there tends to be a lot of um unified or uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Standard sizes for things. And that might be a place where you'd be able to get away with something more like that. And also, I think that because the countries are a little more packed together, you're able to do these things um, and they're, they're spread out. That might, that might work out. Battery swap systems. Power. Um, as with anything in the world uh, with bicycles, power is going to change dramatically depending on what you end up buying. There's actually restrictions in Europe for only 250 watts of power for these e-bikes. And you can go up, depending on where you live in the world, up to a semi-ludicrous 750 watts here in the U.S. Of course, we have the muscle bikes for e-bikes, don't we? Um, more power gets you, well, you know, more. It, 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 it gets you faster, it gets you further, whatever, but it also drains batteries faster. And in the research that I was doing, it seems that 250 watts of power is probably your sweet spot from a touring perspective because it gives you that great uh, separation, or not separation, but that great overlay of power that you need and range that you have with your given battery. So that's, I think, a really good sweet spot to be in. So I think that generally around the world, you're going to be able to find 250 watt e-bike assists out there from a battery perspective. Like I said, these are improving all the time. And the key metric here is watt hours. And I am no electrical engineer. My dad is. He would make fun of me for even attempting to talk about this. But um, let's let's file this under duh here. The higher the number, the more watt hours you have on your bike situation, your battery situation, the more range you're, event, you're essentially going to have. That's the number of watts that you can burn, for lack of a better way of putting it, over a given hour. Here's, and this is where things get a little complicated. Different bikes, different bike batteries are going to have different voltages. They're going to range anywhere from 12 to 48 volts. And you don't want to like look at just voltage because that's going to tell you what your range is. You're not going to want to look at just your milliamp hours, which is the thing that you look, you're buying when you're buying a, a, a battery bank. It'll say, oh, this has 24,800 milli milliamp hours. That doesn't tell you your range so well uh, with a battery. They're, they're going to be measured more in amp hours because they're bigger batteries. 
multiply the amp hours for your battery by the voltage for that battery and that bike configuration. That's going to be able to give you an apples to apples comparison between different voltage bikes out there. As you would expect, a 12 volt bike is going to be on the cheaper side. The batteries are going to be smaller. Your range is going to be smaller. If you've got a 48 volt bike, it's going to have, it's going to be a, a bigger thing. You know, well, you're multiplying by 12 versus 48. You know, you can get the idea there. So, but the, the, the watt hours is going to be able to tell you the differences between these bikes in a more, well, scientific way, math way. Math is good. So, um, that's something when you're shopping for them, if you're saying, Oh, well, this 12 volt bike is really, really inexpensive. You may decide, look, the range on this thing is just not going to be good enough compared to maybe a, a 48 volt bike which is certainly going to have a larger battery, but it might be a better thing for you from a touring perspective. So pay attention to that. Battery strategy, I, I think I mentioned this before, I think carrying at least a couple with you is a, a good idea, at least from the perspective of safety. You know, making sure that you've got the range, because as I mentioned before, if you run out of juice and you don't have any more electrons left in your batteries, you're going to be biking a much heavier bike. Now, if you've got downhill for the rest of your day, maybe you don't care, but um, I think it's it's something that you should probably consider carrying. It's probably worth the weight to carry, too. The other thing is, is that you're going to want to be able to charge, perhaps, with a long break at lunch. I was reading one of the resources here that I've, I, I've I'll mention at the end of here. It's also in the show notes um, talking about taking a long lunch and maybe even being able to get another 50 kilometers of range just by taking an hour long lunch lunch break or more to be able to charge up one of your batteries that that can really extend your day, which I think is a really smart idea. So battery strategy is something you'll want. My final take here. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be, what am I looking at? I, I think I've been talking for 27 minutes now. Uh, you, you, you can clearly tell I'm intrigued, but I don't think I'm intrigued enough in the near term to be necessarily doing this. Definitely down the line because two things. One, batteries are getting better and better, which means I think the bikes are going to get better and better. I think they're also going to get more efficient. And I think that there's going to be more and more uh, of an idea of using these things for longer distance transportation as well. So I think that that's really intriguing. Also, you know, as I get older and as I find maybe my range on a traditional bike is not going to be as, as long and I'd like to do more, well, this is going to be helpful for down the line. I think, oh, what if I get injured? What, you know, what, what if my knees go at some point? I think it's, I think it's, an, it's something to be looking at down the line. I think this is also going to help with the mysterious James's of the world who found that headwinds were starting to really defeat them. This might be something as a kind of a panacea, as a solve, as a balm, if you will, for headwinds, especially if you're doing a tour in a place that is notorious for it. Hi, Wyoming. I am looking at you. <laughs> so maybe that's something. Or maybe where there's lots of climbs that are outside of your capability. Um, or you just want that little extra nudge. You'd want this to be less of a slog and more of an enjoyment. You know, a little e-assist, that would certainly do it. I am firmly hashtag not cheating on all of this. And oh, by the way, there's somebody in Ohio. You don't listen to the podcast, but you might know who you are. I got to race you on one of these things. As I mentioned, I've got some resources here in the show notes uh, from cyclingabout.com. Really a kind of comprehensive uh, review that I think is a good one-stop shopping. I've got the link in the show notes for that. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours like the Kessel Run. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skado, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgadis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Bucken, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Henkel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, 
William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Piroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messinger, David Grotke, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lecko, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCulloch, John Hickman, Jack Smith, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Dave Fletcher, James Stratakis, David Neves, Mike Lazuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Wilde, and thanks also to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.